by the way, I teach in the law school as well, so you can imagine that. But anyway, I'm, uh, I come at this with ex extreme bias or prejudice. I am a market, I believe in markets, and small, bigger markets, more free markets, uh, smaller government, less government, more, less interference. And as you can probably guess, I'm also not a very happy person over the last year or so. And it looks like I'm going to have a bit more pain to go. And it, we'll all have a little bit more pain to go the way I see it. Now, again, that's my model, perhaps not your model. It's certainly not my student's model. But anyway, uh, um, I'll apologize for our presentation today. It's a bit dated. I put it together last night. So you can imagine. <laughs> I mean, everything's just changing as, as I speak, and uh, it's, uh, you know, but also uh, everybody looks to economists and they tell us that everything's either zero probability or 100% probability. You know, is it, are we going to enter a recession? Yes or no? Uh, no. Are we going to this and that? It's always 100%. And everybody goes, well, Goss said, and I'm like, I, I did put a caveat in there. And you've already, you heard what Truman said about economists. If I'm a one-armed economist because we always, well, on the one hand and the other hand, that's, that's economist for you. <laughs> and so that said, I've served in the military. I should put that in there, my bio as well. I, I, was, uh, uh, I flew on a mil uh, P3A Orion, if you know what that is, looking for submarines. But anyway, they sent me to, uh, I was in the Navy, they sent me to Norfolk for air crew training. And if you know, and my parents took me down to the Atlanta train station. I grew up in, uh, in Georgia. And they took me down to the Atlanta train station. Only the Navy would send you to air crew training in a train. But anyway, I got, <laughs> I got to Portsmouth. As you may know, Portsmouth and Norfolk are separated by a tunnel. And I'm sweating bullets. I mean, I've got to get over there. And I'm not, I was a young guy didn't, and didn't know what, much of what I was doing. Still don't. But anyway, I'm trying to get over there. And as you may know, if you've been in the military, you know, at Creighton, sometimes, in fact, today I'm going to be a little bit late for class. We can be late. In the military, no. That's called AWOL. And there's a little penalty that goes along with that. So I'm, I got to get over there. And this guy, he sees me nervous, and, he, and I'm in a fast food place. He says, I'll take you. So we get in his car. We're going under the tunnel. And I said, how do you know? How do you know? And I'm a sort of wise guy. I said, how do you know I'm not a serial killer? And he turns to me and says, he says what, you know what the probabilities are of two serial killers being in this car <laughs> at this time? <laughs> okay. So anyway, there, uh, it's the, the, but the, if those who have to leave early, this economy is slowing down. It is. It's hard to believe that we've not enjoyed the prosperity just yet, and now we're slowing down again. And what we're looking for, the last slide, I want to, I'll, again, those who have to leave early, we're talking about Jay Powell, and the big test, Jay Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve, and the issue is, is he going to be re replaced in February? Big, big issue, and you say, why is that a big issue? Because it gives us a little bit of a preview of what's to follow for the next three years of the Biden administration. I mean, in other words, if he's going to be replaced, he's running for, he's running for that office, by the way. He's trying to please the president, and apparently, apparently, Senator, or as I call him, Colonel Sanders, you know, I mean, that's what, it looks like the, everything that we heard Senator Sanders say is what we're getting now. I mean, that's exactly, I mean, I don't remember candidate Biden ever saying any of these things. If he did, I wouldn't have voted for him. Just, I didn't do that. <laughs> I thought that would get a laugh. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. Um, but the challenges for this year, commercial real estate, enough said there, it is a challenging, challenging market right now. And it's going to remain challenging for some time yet. I mean, in other words, the, I'm talking about mostly retail space, commercial office space, challenging. But on the flip side, of course, you've got a housing market that is on fire, on fire. I get calls, I own a few rental properties, I can't, it's difficult, I have to turn off my ringer on my phone in class and everywhere else to go because they're ringing all the time. I want to buy your property, I want to buy your property. So it's a hot market. So anyway, but not commercial. Inflation, Powell said, that it's transitory. 
I mean, every night he goes to bed crossing his fingers, please, dear God, let it be transitory. <laughs> because he doesn't know, nor do I. But I can tell you this, all of it's not transitory. Part of it is here to stay for a while. Part of it's here to stay. And the real, the concern I get, I'll move over to this one. Federal debt and modern monetary theory. All of a sudden, if somebody tells you, I'm an advocate of modern monetary theory, you just, you shake your head, put your hand on your wallet, turn around and run. Because <laughs> it it's not a theory. It's wacko. It's crazy. But there are some economists, not many, not any reputable, well, perhaps I shouldn't say that, but I don't think any reputable economists are, are agreeing with modern monetary theory. And the only, you know, uh, Alexander uh, Cortez, Ortiz, what a, you know, AOC. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I don't, I no disrespect to her. She does believe in what she says and she is a strong believer and she believes in modern monetary theory. But the idea, and you can't do it. It's called, we, you know, they call it a theory. In graduate school, we call that monetizing the debt. Simple as that. We didn't have it called a theory. It's not a theory, modern monetary theory. What you're talking about is if no one else will buy that debt of the U.S. federal government, the Fed will buy it. In other words, print more money. And AOC says, do it. And you're hearing, the bank. in Japan, it's coming out right now, Japan, saying we've got to do modern, they don't call it, I don't think they call it modern monetary theory. They say, you know, issue, issue more debt. And we're issuing more debt. Think about the three and a half trillion dollars this thing, this new infrastructure bill, which as you know, is not infrastructure, is not infrastructure. There's a tiny sliver that's infrastructure. It's not enough infrastructure. But anyway, we're moving up to 150% of GDP. And that's not a problem right now, it's not. But as, as the Herb Stein, you may not remember, well, you wouldn't remember him. He was, a, he was the chief economic advisor to uh, to President Eisenhower, and his son be went on to greater fame. He was a chief economist. His son became a comedian, and that, you know, it's Ben Stein. And anyway, Herb Stein once said, if something can't go on forever, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. Now that is, that's a truism, that's 100%. <laughs> that's one of those 100%. So when will we know when it's gonna stop? That's, that's up for us. And if you don't know, I, I certainly don't know, but keep an eye on the 10-year treasury, yield on that treasury. And I've said it for years now, and it keeps going down mysteriously. This is the most amazing thing in economics, politics, anything, is the 10-year treasury yield. It's now at 1.3%. After Powell made his statements last week, it went down even more. And, he, and people say, well, he's going to tighten. That was not a tightening speech. He said he's pulling back some of the stimulus. And that, in other words, they're, they're saying in the fourth quarter, they're going to take back some of the stimulus. How much? Mortgage-backed securities. So if we do see that, which I think we will, but that's if even there, then the mortgage rates will rise somewhat, the 30-year mortgage rate. And we've been, I've been saying that for six months now, that mortgage rates are be rising, and they haven't. And why have they not? Fear, fear. Everybody is fear. We're all in, we're so fearful. We're so fearful that we'll put, buy these bonds that pay 1.3% and now what's inflation? 5%. Now you don't have to be an economist to tell you that difference is a heck of a loss. You're taking a heck of a loss adjusted for inflation. Now why are you doing it? Because you're scared. You're scared and everybody on the face of the globe is scared. So why are you buying these bonds and driving the yields down? Because it's the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry. I mean, ours is bad, but everybody else's is worse. So we continue to buy these bonds. So when we get less fearful, the yield will begin rising. When the Fed pulls back on the mortgage-backed securities purchases, they buy 40 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities. They buy $80 billion of U.S. Treasury. So President Biden and his uh, group can run deficits that are huge. We're talking about a deficit this year and next year. And I mean, uh, 
Pelosi believes she can get this bill through, the three and a half trillion dollars. And we've got one, one safety measure, I think, and that would be the senator from West Virginia, Manchin. Manchin is the key. If he says no, it maybe is no. If he says yes, hold on to your seatbelt. It's going to be a rough ride because we're talking about what's happening. And everybody says, this is so hard to figure out. It doesn't, you don't have to, it's not. You don't have to be an economist to figure out what's happening now. People are getting, workers, are getting more to stay at home than to work. That is not hard. And you say, well, I thought they took back that uh, premium for unemployment pay. They did. They are taking it back. We've already took it back here. But think about the increase in uh, food stamps last month. And I'm not opposed to that. That was 25%. Think about the $350 a month credit or money in the pocket for my daughter who has a child who's four years old. She gets it every month, $350. All of a sudden, you know, what's, how much of a motivation is there to go and work? How many times, how many of you been in a restaurant when you can't get any help? How have you run your own restaurant? Getting help is very difficult. Well, it's because the pay, the, how much you get for going in there versus getting out of here is not there. It's not there. So what we're seeing is wages beginning to rise, but that's not keeping up with the inflation rate. So real wages are going down. But anyway, I won't stick too much on that. Higher pay for remaining out of work. Democrats agree on the $3.5 trillion infrastructure bill. That is very scary. If it happens and the Republicans go in, go in line with that, that's a lot, a lot of money. And it does, it's the incentives for remaining out of work are going to increase, increasing. And so what we're talking about, think about, we talk about the U.S. economy's back. GDP it is. Employment, we're not. We're still down 4%, 4 to 5% from pre-pandemic levels. In other words, we're, we've got, we've got 10.2, I want to say, you know, mix up your billions and your billions and million, 10.1, 10.2 million job openings, and there are about 9 to 10 million unemployed workers. In other words, there's a great mismatch there. Mismatch, and it's, it's going to push up inflation, wages, I should say, and it has to some degree. But anyway, and here's what I want to also, supply chain disruptions and delays. Our manufacturing survey comes out Wednesday. That's one of the first, the biggest restraint on our economy, that's this regional economy, is supply chain disruptions. The inability to get inputs in and outputs out. It's very difficult. I mean, how many times, I mean, uh, I have this cereal oat bran that I, I, I mean, I'm a creature of habit. I need oat bran in the morning. It ain't there. It's $11 a box. And for me, that means it ain't there almost, you know. <laughs> my, my wife says, well, it's $11. I'm like, okay. I mean, we, and not only, so the, even things like that, that you can't get any, right now, that's really gonna, it hasn't yet pushed up prices as much as it could push prices up. We've seen some restraint there. Okay, so though, and that's the biggest, that's one of, that is the number one challenge that businesses, manufacturers in this part of the nation face, and I would bet most of the nation. So, um, Biden's bike, bailout of overspending state and local governments, that's already happened. In other words, and it's true at my own university, we went through this tremendous uh, pullback. All of us had to start teaching more and work, working more and getting less money. And all of a sudden now we've gotten fat again. And I'm like, where did it came from the federal government? They sent us money. They sent all these universities money. They sent local governments money. They sent state governments money. And all of a sudden, we're all fat again. So that's, uh, it's, and you see a rush to municipal bonds and there's gonna to continue to be a rush to buy these municipal bonds because there's less of apt to be failures and the interest rates because of higher taxes that are proposed in the $3.5 trillion stimulus bill, this is going to make these very attractive. Now, the, we, the easy money's already been made, no doubt, but still that. Uh, deductibility of state and local taxes. We may see that bad idea return. The subsidizing of high spending state and local governments across the nation. We don't need to see that. 
in my judgment. That was one of the best things to come out of the 2017, December 2017, Trump tax cut was getting rid of that. Even though all of us, we don't get to deduct our number, if you live in Nebraska, our taxes, but we needed that. Uh, that, could, that could go away is my point. Higher taxes and small business for small business owners, no doubt about it. I, um, I do, I'm speaking in South Dakota, Pierce, South Dakota next week, I think. And you know, they're going to zap me. Every time I set foot in South Dakota, I get a note from, I don't know, Attorney General or somebody saying I owe some taxes because some of my money I made last year belongs to South Dakota. I mean, that's, in other words, they're getting aggressive, more aggressive and aggressive about getting their tax money. And that's small business owners. Capital gains taxes, taxes regular income. That's a huge issue, of course. I mean, can you imagine being taxed and above my rate, those, those are the tax there. That's, that's, I won't say a calamity, it's not a calamity, but it's certainly not supportive of high growth, which we all want to see. All want to see, and this, by the way, this stimulus, Who's benefited? All of us in this room. We continue to benefit. We talk about income inequality. That, that, this is what we've done over the last two years is really supportive of high income people and not of low income individuals. Now they are benefiting some degree, but anyway, and they keep thinking they can tax us, tax us into income equality. It has never worked. In fact, it works worse. That we keep trying to tax Warren Buffett, and it hasn't worked. Warren Buffett, and those of a, in his income category, down to those who make a million, a measly billion, don't pay it. We pay it, and those of us in lower income pay it. And by the way, 60% of Americans, 60% of Americans last year paid no income taxes. 60%. Now, how are you going to cut their income tax? Well, we do. There is a way of doing that. It's called an earned income tax credit, and we do that, and that's not such a bad deal. At least that encourages you to do some work. Return to the pre-2018 tax laws. Remove, this is a biggie. I haven't heard this yet. Can you imagine taking, off, taking the cap off taxable uh, Social Security wages? That's, that's, gonna be, that's a hefty rate pay a tax increase. And that would be a big hitter right there. And I, I, I'm, I will be surprised if we don't hear about it, we don't even see it. Higher corporate tax rates, Yellen. Yellen, Janet Yellen is an economist. You'd think she, would, she got her economics in Moscow somewhere, you know? <laughs> she, taught at the, she taught macro at the University of California, Berkeley. Now I taught at Cal State in, uh, in Fresno, but nonetheless, <laughs> she is now, what, she's engaged in behavior that's criminal. If you did this in the US, you'd be, you'd be before the Attorney General, you'd do, be doing some time maybe. You can't, she's, and by that I mean setting tax rates, you know, this level of playing field. Who for? Not, not for Ireland, they're going to keep their taxes low. We're, we, want not, we want them to raise their taxes. We don't want to bring ours down. We want to raise ours up. Again, Janet Yellen's doing that. I call it a green new deal. A green new deal is a green raw deal in some ways. How are we going to get rid of those blades on wind energy production, the wind turbines, so on? Now, I'm not opposed. We do need to do something about climate change. There's no doubt. If I said we didn't, I would be... I would be under more pressure at Creighton than I am already. You know, can you imagine being on a campus? I mean, I'm lucky to keep my office as it is. Uh, so, we were, yeah, that's, it was called a hiring mistake. I think that's what they call it. <laughs> Higher oil prices, well, there's, there's a little doubt. Get this one, I mean, President Biden says we want to, I work for, by the way, I did work for on the Keystone XL pipeline, so I'm not entirely unbiased, but nonetheless, he cuts down the Keystone XL pipeline, then no drilling on federal lands, no new drilling, and then he's asked Saudi Arabia to increase their oil production. That's in the name of, is as if you can clean up your house by just cleaning up the kitchen. You gotta clean up the living room too. Saudi Arabia is in our living room. So we, they provide, and by the way, it's more, uh, as my 
energy friends tell me their oil is dirtier than our oil, but that's, that's another story. Punishes low-income workers, residential construction. We're still seeing supply constraints, but we're seeing that ease up a bit. So if I were going to sell my house, I'd probably want to do it now. Uh, while there's so much pressure, upward pressure on it. Can you imagine, I don't know if you faced higher, oil, higher prices in your neighborhood, but I mean, people are saying, boy, aren't you pleased that your next door neighbor's house sold for 30% more than what you expected? No, I'm not in the business of selling my house. I'm in the business of living in my house. And it's, it's like farmers will look at their land that's going up in value. Aren't you pleased? No. I'm not in the business of selling farmland, I'm in the business of raising corn or wheat or whatever. And that's the same with us. What are we going to do in Nebraska when our tax bills hit this year? That's going to be a little tough. And the mayor or the, our politicians say, well, I reduced your tax rate by 1%, but you raised my valuation by 50%. You know, what about that? Yeah. Okay. Look at commodity price growth. Look at all commodities. That last, these are three month annualized. 26%, that's three month annualized now, please. It's not, it's not the three months, it's three months annualized. These are the latest numbers. Farm products, and it's not gonna get any better. I mean, think of the drought conditions. You've gotta believe, you know, drought conditions in, in Russia, drought conditions in Brazil, drought conditions obviously in the US, in California particularly, the west of here, that's, we're gonna see some higher prices there. We might see corn above $6 a bushel, again and maybe even higher than that i have no I, I don't know enough about it look at lumber prices we said there was a pullback in lumber prices not yet lumber prices are still higher and then market yields here's what we've done here's what the federal reserve has done to stimulate some of that growth this is not natural i will argue it's stimulated to some degree by the federal reserve now they're not it's more to do with federal spending, more to do with bad, bad federal policy than the Federal Reserve. But these are January, this is before the pandemic, and then what we're seeing down there. This is one-year treasury, two-year treasury, 10-year treasury, 30-year treasury, and corporate yields. These corporate yields, these are high-yield corporates, often called junk bonds. Can you imagine getting paid 4.2% on a junk bond? I can't. That's not enough for me to be buying junk bonds. Now, again, uh, I don't, I'm not the, I'm certainly not, a, don't take my, as I do, I've said this on the radio. I say, don't listen, listen to me. Well, don't listen to Warren Buffett for economic advice. Don't listen to Ernie Goss for, for investment advice. Both of them are worth about what, not much. He targets for higher taxes. I'm saying buy whatever. Okay, price growth again. Look at this, gold. This is the strangest thing. Gold is a safe haven against inflation, but we're not seeing the growth there. Where is it? And I'll show you where it has come. There's Bitcoin, look at that. Now this is the last number. This is annualized three month moving average. Now this overstates the decline. You, you know, and I know about Bitcoin. Is it 40 to 50,000, but it was 50 to 60,000. Look for a Bitcoin called ADA. I don't know if it's ADA or ADA. Named after ADA Lovelace, one of the first computer programmers back in the 19, 19th century. But anyway, Bitcoin is what we all talk about, but it's Ethereum and maybe ADA and Dogecoin or Dogecoin. So, and think about this. The IRS has now gotten into the business. And you know, I'm just, I love the IRS kinda, but not only at cocktail parties, not on a day, not at day-to-day -day business. I mean, what they're doing, they want to convert. When you buy something with a Bitcoin, if you go buy your Tesla, you paid $4,000 for the Bitcoin. You take it to Tesla and Elon Musk, give it to me. You drive out of here with one of those S-Class and you all of a sudden have a tax burden because you converted it from 4,000 to 50,000 or whatever. There's a $46,000 capital gain you just got, according to the IRS. You say, well, that can't be true. It's money. And if you convert 
a Bitcoin to a yen to a euro to a yuan, that's not taxable. Why is this taxable? Because they say it is. They, and they're going to say it and they're going to get it. Again, I'm not a Bitcoin. I don't buy it. I've never owned it. And uh, I might buy Ada or Ada. I'm not certain about that one. Uh, but there's, you see, silver as well. Silver and gold have not been the hedge against inflation. What's been the hedge, if you can call it, can you call Bitcoin a hedge? It can't, I don't see how it can be a hedge against anything. But people are buying it. And Monique, who's assisting me today, she, you go to Reddit, right? And you're buying, and I advise her to not buy that. She buys it, she makes money. I mean, she, <laughs> she, she's made more money by going against my advice. <laughs> I mean, I gotta start giving her, advi giving her more advice than finding out what I gave her and taking it myself, but, or not taking it myself. And that's some considerations of volatility of gold. Not much, silver, Bitcoin, 0.53. The volatility of that, significant volatility. So if you don't get in unless you're ready for a ride, and you know that as well as I do. Okay, here they serve as, there's a correlation between inflation and Bitcoin. It's been the oddest thing that inflation goes up, Bitcoin prices go up, and fairly consistently. Instead of gold going up, as I expected, my own gold, uh, some gold, not much, but Bitcoin has, Bitcoin's taken the gain. It's the oddest thing, and I think it's because of Reddit, you know, some people on Reddit, you day traders, you know. Okay, enough, enough slamming the day traders. Gold and silver, 65, uh, the correlation between the two, between the two is 65, 0.65. And the, where, what could it be? Negative one is the lowest number, Plus one is the highest number. 0.65 is a strong correlation. 0.40 is a pretty strong correlation as well. Now when we look at Bitcoin is equal to money, is it? Well, it has to be a medium of exchange. That's one of the requirements. Must be in El Salvador, you can, it's money on the street, I guess. I mean, how do you, it's not like you take it in, here's your Bitcoin, I mean, you've got, it, you've got it's got to be your cell phone, something there, or your laptop, or something you go around with you. But medium of exchange, is it? Not yet. It is not a medium of exchange. I have seen a, a steer auctioned off, and it was auctioned off for a Bitcoin. Uh, uh, several Bitcoins, not just one, but several Bitcoins on, a, on an auction, online auction. I have seen that. Um, must be a store of value. It can only be a store of value if it's not up and down. I mean, I'd hate for my, Mark, I don't know if your retirement, you based it on, it's not in Bitcoin, is it? I bet you. No, <laughs> no. I don't, well, we won't get into that. Accounting measure, Tesla sales measured in Bitcoins. I mean, Elon Musk is maybe that wacky. He just might do it. Is his sales, instead of being in dollars, is in Bitcoin, and you figure it out. You know, that's, it could be. Ultimately, here's my assertion. Ultimately, one Bitcoin, at least one, will survive. Which one? I just don't, I don't know if it's going to be Bitcoin. Will it be Ada? Will it be Dogecoin? Will it be Ethereum? I think more, I just don't think it's going to be, I just don't know. Obviously, I don't know. I would be, get an ETF, that a little exchange-traded fund. IRS is taxing and purchases as if it is an asset, not a medium of exchange. An asset, like you, change, you take a stock, you go into 7-Eleven, I'll trade you this GM stock for that. That's how they're wanting to treat it. Okay, now here are the economic indicators to tell us, I've talked a lot about next year, let's talk about the rest of this year. The rest of this year, um, there, there's a national number. This is manufacturing, 59.5 is a strong reading. If you went back here, here, that's not a strong reading. This is the when uh, COVID-19 hit. And here's our Creighton number, look at that. But notice, well you can't notice, because I didn't, yeah I did put it here, July. No, I didn't put August reading. That's for tomorrow morning. We released that on Thursday morning, it's down. The US number is probably gonna be down. In other words, the economy is cooling down, looks like. The manufacturing sector, the overall economy is cooling. Not 
recession. That's not what I'm saying. It's, it's just cooling down. So in other words, that program that the Federal Reserve has about pulling back, they're going to be pulling back more slowly than we thought. It's not going to be the program that Quarles thinks we need to do. It's not going to be the program that uh, Jay Bullard at St. Louis Federal Reserve thinks we should do. It's going to be something more on the plus side, more accommodating to the president and those who want to see this keep on going, keeping on going, meaning not so much inflation, but there's the uh, rural Main Street survey, the bankers, and by the way, if you wish to be, we survey bank CEOs and chief loan officers and chief financial officers each month in 10 states. If you wish to be part of that survey, you get a newsletter each month and um, that's about what you get, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we advertise it is free and well worth the price. It takes about five to 10 minutes of your, five, seven minutes of your time. You can just give your name and email address to Monique here if you would. But this, uh, the economy according to the bankers, according to you, is cooling a bit, but still strong. We haven't seen these farmland prices, these agricultural equipment sales since 2012 and 13. In other words, the ag economy. And if you look ahead, if you've got crop, you're good to go. Of course, if you have, don't have crop, you're not good to go, meaning if you drought. So in other words, you're gonna see higher prices. I just don't see any way out of it. Now, how much higher is gonna depend on drought conditions? How do we get an improvement? And agricultural equipment sales. Look what's going on with MOO. That's an exchange farm ETF. MOO, M-O-O. -O. It's been like this. Of course, that's because of uh, these companies that are doing well. Fertilizer companies, uh, agricultural equipment companies such as John Deere doing very well. Why are they doing well? Because the farmer's doing well. And the farmer, by the way, uh, well, we have to worry, worry you, you, if you're not concerned about pork, you've got to be a little concerned about Nebraska pork. If you may, you may not know that California has just dictated that the, far, the pork, the only pork served in California has to be grown in these bigger confinements, in other words, larger areas. So that's going to come back here, I guess. I don't, that, that's January of 2022 that comes into effect. So pork, there could be some big changes in pork going forward. Of course, that spills over into beef as well. But looking at this now, reports from the CEOs, farmland prices, the uh, past year, uh, farm rents, 7.3% growth, future growth, 2.4%. Now that's the bankers, not me. That's their assessment. Next to them, farm equipment sales best since 2012, net, come, net farm income, highest since 2013, not as much federal support. 40%, 46% of our bankers reported drought conditions. Significant drought, or not, I shouldn't say significant. All the way from not much to severe. So this is across states from North Dakota all the way down to Missouri and Kansas and, and Nebraska and Iowa and Minnesota. 10% favor, 10, oh, well, this is a huge one. 10% favor the $3.5 trillion infrastructure bill. I, I, I put that on Facebook and I'm telling you, I never got so much resistance. 10%, why are they? Oh, I'm sure they are too big to fail. I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, in other words, your banks, our banks get thrown in with JP Morgan. I mean, Jamie Dimon, I tell my students, Jamie Dimon, who could have had a better name than Jamie Dimon, head of uh, JP Morgan? I mean. He's a politician. I mean, he's too big to fail, yes. Okay, and now bottlenecks. Eight out of 10 manufacturers report this. Highest inflationary pressures in 30 years. Wholesales at 8.6, retails at 7.7. That's, that's the next 12 months. Finding and hiring qualified workers, biggest constraint. That's, I should have changed that. That's not the biggest constraint. The biggest constraint right now is supply chain disruptions. And conclusions, Monique's telling me I gotta move quickly here. Indicators to watch Federal Reserve action, actions on MBS, mortgage-backed securities. No change till November, and even then, I think this slowdown is probably gonna have them on the sidelines. Maybe they'll pull back a little bit. But pull back does not mean they're not stimulating. They're still buying. 
just not as much. So less stimulus, and that's a good thing in my judgment, pushing long-term interest rates higher. Okay, first time claims for unemployment insurance coming out every Thursday, those have been very good. Employment report comes out this Friday, very important report, and looking for 500,000, if 500,000 above, very good. Below 200,000, not good. In other words, below 100,000, bad. So we'll see, this will affect Federal Reserve actions. So that'll be this Friday. Crichton's results, oh, it's not. Gold prices, silver prices, Bitcoin, 10-year treasury, all those together. Keep an eye on that 10-year treasury yield. It's, it's one of the best markers we have, but it's being, its usefulness has been somewhat destroyed by the Federal Reserve by them buying those bonds. So if they're not in the market, then the, we get to see, we get to see some what's really going on, not what the Federal Reserve has done. Now, I'm not, I think the Federal Reserve has done a great job, but we've had enough of it now, I think. Uh, ISM surveys, that's Creighton's, that comes out Wednesday. The outlook, Federal Reserve will begin tapering no later than quarter four. Municipal bonds still pretty, pretty good there. As we see, as we see a, if, we, if the Congress passes higher taxes, then that's going to be a good place to be. Rates will go, we could see the prices going up and the yields coming down even more. Um, and if you own them, that's a good thing. Short-term interest rates will remain near record lows till I think we'll see them in the second half of 2022. Now that's assuming we don't get into a recession, of course. Right now there's no recession ahead, but we're talking about slower growth, okay? Uh, the $3.5 trillion spending plan before Congress, federal debt's gonna to continue to grow. Growth declines to still okay pace. Inflation turns upward in the second half of 2021, partially, partial transitory. Not all, it's not all transitory as the Federal Reserve would like. It's a bit, some of it's gonna stick. Their goal is 2% inflation and probably 4% on the unemployment rate. We're not gonna to get to the 4% on the unemployment rate, we, we will, and we're not gonna to get to the 2% on the inflation gauge. It's gonna remain with us for a while yet. And the reason is, why does, why does there, some in the press are mystified by Powell, why he keeps saying it's transitory, it's transitory. Because he has a, this, we, he wants us to continue to believe it's transitory. As long as we believe it's transitory, it sort of is transitory. As soon as inflation expectations began to rise, interest rates began to rise, and the Federal Reserve, if you go through the 1980s, as I did in the 70s, as most of us, some of us did. Ethanol improves for the year. Gosh, I don't know, this is a toughie. And that Nebraska, it's important, it is an important industry, but of course, oil prices came down and corn prices went up. That's gonna be, ethanol is gonna remain tough depending on federal policies and blending levels. What happens in Iowa in terms of demanding, putting in pumps, E10 e pumps and so on. That's the, the Governor Reynolds mandated that, uh, that I believe that's correct. Hasn't passed yet. Sports betting, casinos in Nebraska, free for all. Uh, it's gonna be a, uh, Norfolk is about to, I, well, I lived in Norfolk, uh, North, Norfolk, sorry. Uh, I, can't, I can't ever do that. Just, uh, anyway, the casino is perhaps going in there and maybe a casino in Columbus a casino in Omaha, casinos and now. North Platte's getting one too? Good, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I, and the horse track. And a horse track, hey. Well, you know what happens when economists have their meetings in, in Las Vegas? All the prostitutes leave town and all the tables close up. I mean, we're, we're just a bad group of people. We don't bet. Well, I don't know about the other. I won't talk. I shouldn't talk about We're the other. Oh, bankers, though, when you guys come to town. Yeah, that's, I don't know. Sorry for that. I guess I'll get closed down for that. Sorry. Susan, I didn't mean to say that. Okay. And the black swan, I just threw this out. What's a black swan? A, a high-cost, low-probability event. But think about China seeing us weak, or 
seemingly weak, invading Taiwan. That would be obviously a black swan because our semiconductors, I've been thinking I was going to buy an automobile this fall. I, looks like I'm not. Now, if you've been out there trying to get a car, a new car, it's not there. The, the, they'll you know, take you for a ride in a demo, but then you order it and it comes later. I don't like that. So anyway, our newsletter, it's free and well worth the price. And you can go to Gosson Associates and...